I was asked by the organizers to take the, the title as, as literally as I possibly could. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you things that are not there. That's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the task. So, so let's immediately start with the first uh, slide and let's ask everyone to, to focus in the center of this uh, image that you see over here. Um, in the cross, don't move your eyes and just watch it for a little while. And um, hopefully, even though everyone, if you're just looking around, uh, was seeing that these were little uh, purple, purple spots, once you start fixating in the middle, you, first of all, you see all the, the purple spots uh, disappearing, right? And, and while you're at it, you also see uh, green spots appearing that are all not there. And, and, ty and typi typically the way um, these things are described then is, is your, bra your brain is just playing uh, tricks on you, which if you think about it is quite silly. Right? So, so why, first of all, it's sort of philosophical. So, so who is this brain and who is this me and how, how is this brain, brain suddenly a prankster that's, that's trying to, uh, to make a fool out of me? And why suddenly at this very instant do all of our collective brains at the same time decide that it's time to, uh, to start uh, playing tricks? Um, so clearly this is a visual illusion and an illusion is an interpretation of a sensory stimulus that's different from reality, that's from the textbooks. And what I want to try to argue for you guys here is that actually an illusion is something else. It's, it's the best possible solution that the brain can make without a large set of possible realities that might be out there. And I'll try to explain what I mean with uh, that. So, so obviously everything, and all of you have done brain and behavior, right? So, so, so actually I have a... I have a very simple task here because you have lots of background on these sort of things. Um, so, so we all realize that if we see something, it first has to pass uh, through our retina. And, and in the retina, there's all kinds of different processing going on. Um, there's, there's color vision only in the center of our retina. There's a high density of receptors in the center of our retina, which is not out there uh, on the sides, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this means that already what the, the retina is doing is creating a very, very distorted picture of what's actually out there in the real uh, world. So, 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 so for instance, you may have the impression that everything around you is made out of color, but what you're actually seeing is only color maybe in this streak and roughly all the color that you're seeing out there is not something that you're actu actually perceiving, but is something that you're probably remembering from having uh, been able to look at these, these areas before you actually uh, started staring at, at the little cross over there or any of the other positions. Um, one of the other things that, that, you, that your retina does is it's only interested in changes. So, so if you have uh, shaded areas, like, and I'm just using this as an example over here, the, the blue area over here and the white area over here, it will give you information that there is a change from blue to white over here, but it's not giving any information to the brain to the fact that all of this is blue and that all of this is white. And the same happens in time. So if you are fixating at something and it's going to be more or less the same for a serious period of time, it's just your memory that's going to remember this. It's not your actual visual system that's still tell telling you this. And the consequence of that is that you can have different realities out there, different stimuli out there that lead to exactly the same neural information that goes from your retina to your brain. So, so this is then sort of the situation that your brain is facing with. It's, it's a bit like encryption and it's, a, it's in a way um, the problem that an iPod uh, is facing. So, so, so first of all, there's sound, then the sound is is compressed to some in encrypted format, right? So, so, so into a, an MP3. And then once you're playing it, this MP3 is, is recreating the sound. But this analogy is not perfect. So there is outside information being coded and the brain needs to decode this again. But the difference with the MP3 is actually that the coding is ambiguous and that the brain needs to deal with possible things that are happening out there and needs to deal with the most probable solution. So for instance, um, if we want to do the analogy, then 
Um, it might be ambiguous what is being coded, whether the instrument is either a, a saxophone or a, or a flute, right? Um, but um, as soon as, as your iPod knows that this is rock music, then it's, it's more likely to be a saxophone than a flute, and it will play a saxophone. But then it happens to be uh, Jethro Tull, which has a flute, right? And then it will be uh, wrong. And that's exactly what you see when you see one of these illusions. It's making the best possible guess of what's going out there, but uh, since this is a very special circumstance, it's, it's not giving you the, the actual reality that's out there. So, so we're back to our illusion over here, and what we are actually seeing over here is our brain trying to, struggling to make sense of this picture over here. And apparently for us, it's, it's more likely that this, this is not a bunch of purple uh, spots that are there and that, that suddenly disappear. But because you've been uh, staring over here, these, these purple spots disappear. Remember that, that only information is only being given if, um, if, it's, if it's suddenly appearing. So if you're staring at some place and the information is there, then your visual system is not going to transfer this to your brain anymore. So, so everything is, is gray, but then suddenly this, a part of this gray becomes less purple, right? And less purple in, in color theory it happens to be green, and that's where all the funny green uh, spots suddenly appear. So it's going from gray to less gray, hence must be green. But obviously all of this green is being made up uh, by you. So the brain has to think in, um, in plausibilities and impossibilities. It has to deal with probabilities, and it does this according to a very, very nice fundamental uh, formula, um, which is a base rule or base formula, and which is amply used in medicine, uh, in economics, in law, and also by you all the time. And I'll, I'll try to explain this uh, by using an, an analogy from medicine, because that's where I feel comfortable, and then we'll use the analogy to actually go to your sensory system and see that the problem that you're dealing with, which each and every image that you're looking at, is exactly the same problem that, let's say, any GP has when uh, a patient is arriving. So, so what Bayes' rule is about is how to update your current beliefs about what's going on based on um, new evidence. And there's a formula for that, and obviously formulas always looks, uh, look very complicated, but, um, but bear with me, it's not that hard. So, so, so all of these P's that you see over here are our probabilities, our chances, between zero and one. Um, and so PL means the chance that L is happening. Um, if there's a little stripe over there, so-called pipe symbol in between, it means the chance that uh, C is happening if we already know that L is going on. So here's the medicine example. So, so in the medicine example, the L is for leukemia and the C is for coughing. And, and you're this doctor and there's a patient coming in and this patient says, doctor, I'm afraid that I'm suffering from leukemia um, because I've been coughing all the time. I've been looking on the internet to, to reliable sources, obviously. And, uh, and all patients that have leukemia uh, cough all the time. And then obviously it's your chance, your, your task as a GP and remember, this is an analogy for what the brain has, is doing. Uh, your task as a GP is to, to calculate the chance that this patient actually has leukemia. And so th there's a number of factors. So first of all, this is what you need to calculate, right? The chance that you have leukemia, that the patient has leukemia, given that the patient coughs. Um, so first of all, you need to figure out the chance of leukemia. And that's basically, as a GP, you've never seen this patient, but you're just out there in, um, in the place that you work, there's a, um, and how big is the chance that the next patient that will walk in has leukemia? Well, th this obviously is fortunately a very small chance, but these are the sort of things that you learn from experience. So, so, so actually leukemia patients, you haven't seen them that often as a GP. So C is the chance of coughing, which is gonna be much more regular, right? It depends a bit on the time of the year, but based on like the last hundred or maybe the last thousand patients that you've been seeing, you know how big the chance is that the next patient that you've never seen before uh, will be complaining of coughing. And then this is the chance that the patient coughs uh, given that he has leukemia, 
and let's say that this source was indeed reliable, so that th there was a 100% chance, and then you can calculate the chance on leukemia. So let's say that the chance of leukemia was 1 in 100,000, the chance of coughing is, is, is 1 in 10, then actually the chance that this patient has leukemia has gone from 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 10,000, which is still pretty low. But what you've done then is you had a current belief, so there's very little chance that this patient has leukemia. You've got some new evidence, the coughing, and you've updated your chances about how big the chances that this patient has leukemia. So, and there are some, some, some terms to that, so, so your current beliefs are your priors, and the new information is likelihood, and that's all Bayes Bayesian terminology, and the posterior is your new um, assessment of the situation. So exactly the same thing happens uh, with you, basically, when, you, uh, when you're watching something. So, so here is the chance that a certain reality is actually going on at this very moment. This is the chance that a certain sensory information, so a certain coding is coming through your, um, through your optic nerve. And here's the chance that this sensory information happens given this reality and you're combining all of these things into the chance that something is going on, and that's what you need to know, right? That something is going on, given the fact that this is the thing that you're experiencing on your, um, on your retina. And this means that if the, and that's what happens during illusions, right? What happens during illusions is that the sensory information is actually not very, very clear, but you probably have very strong ideas about the things that could happen, should happen, and things that couldn't happen. So, so for instance, in the case of, um, of filling in, I already told you that, that um, all things that are, are filled with one and the same color give you the same information as just the, just the edges. So what I've done here is actually I took out two pencils and I've been drawing just the edge. And as you can see, automatically what your brain is doing is filling in and it's making the white over here much more yellow than uh, the white that's over there. So that's not true, that's your brain uh, not playing tricks on you, but that's your brain finding the best possible solution of what's actually going on over here. Um, what, for instance, can also happen because your visual system is a complicated place, right? We all know that. There's the ventral stream and the dorsal stream, and there's all these kinds of areas that work at the same time. So it's also completely possible that, um, that one part of your brain is telling you that they're, they're seeing motion, and another part of your brain is saying that they don't see any displacement. So what you can see over here are actually moving circles all at the same time, but you can also see that these circles are not displacing. It's not that if you wait long enough that they go full circle, which is physically impossible, but you can nonetheless see something that cannot actually be out there. Um, then there are some higher order priors, so, so things that we know because we've just throughout our life had had the same experiences. So here's a higher order uh, prior of a, a mask. So we've seen lots of faces in our lives, but all of these faces are actually um, uh, convex, right? They, they are shapes that go in this direction and not shapes that are going in this uh, direction with maybe one or two uh, very odd examples uh, and exceptions. But, but here's a mask. Here's the same mask, but it's just being photographed from the inside. And what you can see is that you even though this is, so this is a hollow structure, you can completely see the inside of this mask actually as, as something that's sticking out of the picture rather than going into the picture. Um, another higher order prior is that if we don't see that something is changing, it's probably not uh, changing. And there's a, a very nice um, example of this, which you can see over here. Oh, I, that's still in Dutch. I apologize for that. So here's a picture. Uh, from the city of Tiel, where my, my parents live. Um, and I've been um, doing some Photoshop, so I, I have this picture, I have a variation of that, I have the original picture, and a variation of that again. And here's another picture, and what you can see is, because here the changes are very clear, right? It just goes from one place to the other. Uh, you can immediately see that the shades over there, here at the capital, are, are flashing. So this is something we can see, because there's a very obvious change. Now, if I'm taking that away from you, so if I slightly change the experiment, I have my picture, I have a, a small gray flash, which is only like 100 milliseconds, then I have the Photoshop picture again, a gray flash, 
a Photoshop picture again, a gray flash, etc., etc. You cannot see this actual flashing going on. And then you will see that the task of finding where things are changing from the, the one picture to the Photoshop picture suddenly become much uh, harder. So, so here's the example. Again, it's, 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 uh, it's beta uh, um, inspired in honor of my parents, I suppose. Um, so there's actually three changes every time this thing flashes. And if you, let's, let's do, if you see one, you yell out one, and if you see two, you yell, so who sees two? Two sees three? Three. So who's still at zero? Uh, some people are still at zero. Okay, so in the, so, 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 so now is when the magic, so now is when the magic is going to happen because I'm, I'm going to remove the gray flash and you'll immediately see what's going on over there. Right? And this is how stubborn your priors can be that, that actually an image, if you cannot actually see the changes, you're just going to assume that everything stayed exactly the same um, as it was. Well, this, this happens for all of your perception, for all of your behavior. It actually also happens at the level of single neurons. So, so this is taken from a single neuron um, in the parietal cortex of your brain. Um, well actually, not your brain, but, but the monkey uh, brain. Uh, the experiment here, and I'm going to be very fast uh, in that, is a monkey fixating a dot over here. Then at some stage, uh, there's going to be two dots appearing, but the monkey doesn't yet know where to move its eyes uh, to. But there's an 80% chance that it has to go to the red dot, which he learned by experience, and a 20% chance that it will go to the green dot. But he doesn't know which one it's going to be. Then the dot actually turns red, and now the, the monkey knows 100% sure it will be the red dot. And then actually it can make a movement and it will get a reward. And if we look at the neural activity uh, in the parietal cortex of this monkey, this is what you get. So what you have over here is the initial phase, Here's the prior phase where there's an 80% chance that the monkey will get a reward. Um, here's the same neuron in a situation where it will have a 20% chance. So it's really calculating its chances. Here is the phase over here. Here the monkey knows for sure that it's going to be rewarded. And actually this single, this single one cell, which has no cognition whatsoever, right? But this one cell over here then also knows that it's going to be absolutely certain that it will be rewarded. And then after that, it's gone. So, so Bayesian statistics are something that you need in order to, to combine your, your... Oh, I actually have a summary slide. Um, <laughs> so seeing is an active process. It's not just like there's a picture being taken and a little, um, a little figurine in your head that's just l watching movies and telling you what's going on, right? So seeing is an active process. And the brain has to decode each and every image that you get and has to figure out what the most likely solution is. And in doing that, it's using both the new sensory information, so everything that's on your eyes, but also a lot of prior knowledge. What's likely to happen, what's unlikely to happen, what just happened, what didn't happen. Um, and this explains both the way we behave, with just some of the, the demonstrations that I gave you guys, but actually there's lots of cells in your brain that behave exactly that way, that are simply calculating probabilities and are taking it from there. Okay, thank you very much.